Good morning, everyone. Hope you had a great, uh, you're having a great weekend so far. Welcome to the Young Adults, uh, the summit, day two of the summit. Uh, today, we're talking about purpose and marriage. Uh, we're so glad that you can join us this morning. And so before we, before I start, I will ask Brother Osunachi to lead us in the opening prayer. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good Hallelujah. all the time. And the Lord is good. I want to bless God for everyone joining in today. I want to bless God for your life. And I believe God that light is going to break forth in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. First of all, let's right. lift up our voice and say, Father, we give you praise. Right. Thank Jesus. you, Father, for bringing us. Thank you, Father, for bringing us to this day. Thank you for the revelation. We give you thanks. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your kindness. Father, we bless your name. Father, we bless your name. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Bless that be your name in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that gives us access into your presence. Thank you for the gift of salvation. Thank you for calling us because it is written, many are called, but few are chosen. Thank you for choosing us to serve in your vineyard. Blessed be your name in Jesus. Mighty name we have prayed. I want us to turn our Bible very quickly to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. The Bible there says, it says, truly light is sweet. And the Bible says it is a good thing for the eyes to behold the sun. It said, truly light is sweet. It's a good thing for the eye to behold the sun. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, from 13 to 14, the Bible says, it says, we are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. For us as leaders to be the light of the world, we need to encounter the light of God. As we encounter the light of God, we can reflect that light to the world. So I want you to begin to pray this morning. We're going to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, as you have taught me to this summit this morning, in the name of Jesus, let your life, let your life, enter my life. In the name of Jesus, let your life, enter your life. In the name of Jesus, master, the Bible says wisdom is a place of heart. You forget wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. We are here today to get understanding. So you're going to lift up your voice and pray. You're going to say, Father, in today's session, damage my ignorance. 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 In the precious name of Jesus. Father, in the session, in the name of Jesus, damage our ignorance. 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 In the name of Jesus, 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 Stop our lives, in the name of Jesus, let the light of the world, light of our lives, in the name of Jesus, light of our lives, in the name of Jesus, light of our lives, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we are praying, in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says from verse 2, the Bible says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them. The Bible says, not being mixed with faith in the in their heart. We are going to pray that Father, in the name of Jesus, let my heart be a father last for the word of God. Let my heart be a father ground for your word. In the name of Jesus. 
let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart mix with the spirit to my heart mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk mix with the spirit to my heart thank you let your walk Before we round up, we're going to pray for our the, the, this guest minister that God has anointed to bless us today. Let's begin to lift her up on, into the house of the Lord. Let's say, Father, in the name of Jesus, give her the tongue of the learned that she may know how to speak a word in season. We pray, Father, for the vessel that you have prepared to bless us. Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus, we shall go now. We shall go now. ตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปนะตกปน
There is just so much that God has put inside of me. There is just so much God has put inside of you. Hallelujah. Our song says we'll never settle for less. I encourage every one of us to sing along. It's a pretty simple, simple song. And it goes like this. And we will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you. You like it? Sing with me. We will never settle for less. We know there's more that's found in you. Let's sing it together. We will never settle for less.
sing it now. We would never send. Never settle for less. We know. We know. We know. God has found in you. Two more times. We would never. We would never. We would never. There is more. We know that's more that's you personalize it, Father. I will never, never, never. I will never stand for that. Hallelujah. I will never stand I will never, I will never settle for less. Jesus, I 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, my name is uh, my name is Pastor Fatu Kun. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to this program. And uh, before we go, just for those who are not here yesterday, uh, we we try to define the purpose of the summit. And I believe uh, the intention of the summit is gradually being achieved in our lives. Uh, we took our text, which is a text, which is a theme for this call, for the summit that guides this summit from the book of Mark, Mark chapter nine, from verse one to five. And he was talking about, and he said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, that there'll be some of them that stand here, which are not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus take it, he with him, Peter and James and John, and leaded them up to a high mountain, apart by himself, and it was transfigured before them. And his raiment really became shining exceedingly white as snow, so as no full on earth can white as them. And there appeared unto them Elias and Moses, and they were talking to Jesus. The goal of the summit, I know from what we see, what we set out to achieve, is that Jesus is a, is wanting, was empowering his disciples preparing them to carry on from where he was going to stop after he went to the cross. But there was something he said in the first verse, that there are some people that are going to be here that they are not going to die until they see that the power of God is fully manifested on earth. And I want to believe we are those set of people he was talking about. And what he did for these people he had in mind was to take them to the mountain. So the goal of the summit to separate them, he was taking them there, and he revealed certain things to them. And the other thing that happened to them was that they were transformed and they were empowered as well to carry on. So the goal of the summit is to achieve these three purposes in our lives. And this summit, this first one, this is the maiden edition, uh, is, so, is about purpose. And we thank God for the minister of God I used last night. And I'm so convinced that today, God is gonna do something amazingly great in our midst. Today we have a very wonderful woman of God with us. She's a wife, she's married to a man. That's very important as well in this generation. She's a mother and also she's serving the Lord as a pastor in David Christian Center there in Lagos with her husband, one of our favorite pastors, Pastor Kingsley Okonko. She's trained, she's trained in law, international law and diplomacy, worked in media. But her passion has always been for women and girls. She's the convener of the Just Girls Ministry and also When Women Worship Conference. So with the joy of the Lord, I would like to welcome to our platform here, our various, our favorite pastor, Pastor Midra Kinsley Okonko. You're welcome, ma'am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just welcome her. Praise Thank God. You. Thank you so Hallelujah. much. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Lumi. Um, God bless you for having me. Thank you. I'm so honored. You, like I always say, I don't take it for granted um, when I have the opportunity to minister to God's people. I always see it as a very rare privilege. Thank you, everyone. I see all the claps and all the emojis and everything. Thank you. In this emoji generation, we understand love by emojis. <laughs> so I just want to say thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big privilege to be able to do this. Um, so I hear that you guys had an amazing time yesterday. Um, and I trust God to take us even higher today. Oh, I see my 3 p.m. gang. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, tribe members. Okay, <laughs> so today I'm going. To, I'm supposed to be um, speaking about purpose and marriage, um, and of course, when it comes to talking about marriage, my heart is really in the purpose of marriage, not just in fact that uh, people find who they love or spend their lives together, but that in that spending your life together, that there's something that God has invested in you that you can show forth in the world. So let's start from the common. Um, marriage scripture. So let's start from Genesis 2. I'll read it a little bit and then I'll share some things from my heart and then I'll share my own story um, because I believe that um, 
there are lots of secrets in people's stories and I'm sure that someone will receive their word today in the name of Jesus. So I want to start from Genesis 2 verse 15. I will read the message and it's setting down with the Garden of Eden to work the ground and to keep it in order. So God created the man, gave him an assignment, gave him a purpose, gave him a job, gave him something to do. And it says that God commanded the man and he said you can eat from any tree in the garden except from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, he said, don't eat from it. The moment that you eat from that tree, he says, you're dead. Verse 18 says, and God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So I will make him a helper, a, com a companion. So God formed from the depths of the ground, all of the animals of the field, all of the beds of the earth. And he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And the Bible says, whatever that man called each living creature, that was its name. And the man named the cattle, named the beds of the earth, named the wild animals, what he did not find a suitable companion. And God put the man into a deep sleep. And as he slept, he removed one of his ribs, replaced it with flesh. And then God used that rib that he took from the man to make the woman, and he presented her to the man. And the man said, finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. And he said, name her woman, for she was made from man. He says, therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother, and he embraces his wife. King James says he cleaves his wife, and the two of them become one flesh. The two of them, the man and his wife, were naked and they felt no shame. Please let's say a word of prayer together. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how you will open up your word, give us direction, give us light, answer questions, um, show us the path through this session today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I'm just going to get quickly into it. So from that scripture, it's very clear. God had a plan when he made man. So the first thing I would say, um, if you're going to find your purpose in marriage, is that first of all, you have to find your own purpose as a human being. So God made the man and he gave the man an assignment. Um, so the first thing you must do is find what it is that God has called you to do before you even think about having someone join you to do it. So he, he made the man. He gave the man a place to stay. And he said, this place I've given you, tend it and then he said take care of it um but at some point man can be more productive if he has someone else who will go along with him and this is usually where a lot of men especially make the mistake they think that they have to go and achieve everything that they they are called to do before they mm -hmm. take a wife so the wife is just an addition Meanwhile, the wife is actually the one who's supposed to help you to achieve. I feel like a lot of a lot more men will achieve more. It's not good for the man to be alone. Meaning, the Bible tells us that two are better, are better than one, for they have a good reward. That word good comes back again. So, in other words, what God is saying is that what you would have achieved alone, if you have someone else with you, you will do much better and you will do much better. So, most men think that, oh, I'm going to just figure my life out, then I'll get a woman to join me. You really can't fulfill all that God has called you to do if you do not do things God's way. We must realize that God made marriage. God had the plan for marriage from the very beginning. God had a concept in his mind for how he wanted marriage to be. So it is not a man's idea. It is not the world that, in fact, it's definitely not social media that came up with marriage. God had a natural order and a plan for marriage. Marriage is not, oh, um, you go through primary school, you go through, through, through um secondary school, then you go into the university, after you're out of university, then you get a job and then you get married. It's not about natural order. There's a purpose and a plan. Okay, there's a purpose and a plan for you to get married. And if you don't understand that, you will just think, oh, this is the natural order. So this is the next step for me to take. But for some people, that's not necessarily the next step to take. You need to find out from the person who created marriage, when he wants you to get married, who he wants you to get married to, and why he wants you to get married. Because not everyone is even called to marry. So anyhow, God puts this man in the garden and says it's not good for this man to be alone. But God does something very interesting. God does not just wash. 
and bring Eve. In fact, God did not make the decision for him on who to marry. Usually, God will not make that decision for you. God, what God will do is God will present to you many godly options. And he's watching to see whether you will keep looking to him, whether you will keep hearing him. If you don't have a relationship with God, I don't think what you should be looking for is a relationship with another human being. Your focus should be building a relationship with God. The relationship with God will feed all other relationships in your life. And the truth is, marriage relationship is not the only relationship, but relationship with God. Every other relationship in your life becomes easy because the relationship you have with God informs every other relationship. God created marriage. God gave us a manual for marriage. God didn't say, you know what? You guys just go and just be figuring it out. No. God was still a part of the process, even though he gave um, Adam the right to choose a partner. So God made different kinds of animals and brought it to him. And what Adam did was that Adam checked out. He said, this one, mm, this is a bird. I can't live in the air. So this is not my wife. This is bird, just fly, eagle. He named it, called it what it was. He saw another one say, ah, this is lion. By the way, the lion opened its mouth. Ah, this lion, if I tried to kiss it, my head went, no, I'm not doing this. He moved it, he said, this is lion, let him move on. He saw the giraffe say, ah, the way this one's neck is, there's no way I'm going to, every time I have to kiss, I have to climb. No, I'm not doing this. He found that these animals were not compatible with him. They were, they could help him, but they were not the help that was suitable for him or could be adaptable for him. He would have done all the adapting. So he called them what they should be. Not everyone who comes into your life is meant to go the journey of marriage with you. Some people are supposed to be your friends. So when they come into your life, don't date them. Call them what they should be. This one, oh, it's my sister in the Lord. Oh, this is my colleague at the office. Oh, this is just a member of the choir like me. Oh, this is someone who, call them what they should be. And Bible says that what he called them is what they, were, what they became. Mm. But in all of those things, not one that was suitable for him. So that means he was looking for something. There's something you should be looking for if you want to fulfill the purpose of marriage. There's something you should be looking for if you want to fulfill the purpose that God established for you in your marriage. There's a, the Bible says, deep calls to deep. There must be something about that person that resonates with you. Something must be, there must be something about that person that connects with you. So when, he, when God saw that, oh, this guy did not see anyone that was suitable for him. God now took from inside him. I always believe that your spouse is inside you. You can't marry outside of yourself. If you want to marry the right person, then you have to first be the right person. If you want to marry a godly person, you have to first be a godly person. If you want to marry a friendly person, you have to be a friendly person. He that must have friends must first show himself friendly. So God, God took from him and said, God did not foresee. God presented the spouse to him. Immediately God presented the woman to him. The Bible says, and I love the way the message translation says, it said, the man said, finally, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. He knew that this one came out from him. He knew that there was something about her that connected and resonated with him. You, if you are godly, you know, because people ask me all the time, Oh, how, you, you will say we should marry Christians. But these days, there are so many pretenders. If you are not a pretender, you will know someone who is also not a pretender. If you are godly, you recognize a godly person. It's like, I don't care what part of the world you live. Once you see a Nigerian, if you are a Nigerian, you recognize a Nigerian. You will know instantly, this person Ghanaian, this person East African. Sometimes they don't even need to open their mouth for you to know that they're Nigerians. I remember a couple of years ago, my husband and I were in Paris. Yeah. So <laughs> we're at the airport and you know how the airport is really big. So of course there are trains running through to take you to different um, areas of the different terminals. So we're there and then there's this, this particular train comes, I think every two minutes. But if you come from Nigeria, or you live in the part of Nigeria where I live, um, Lagos. Lagos is very high energy, the bustle energy is very, you know, everybody's hustling, everybody's jumping and everything. And so we're standing by, because when we got there, the train was just leaving. So we're waiting for, I mean, two minutes, two minutes is nothing. Well, not, I mean, it's not nothing, but I mean, every two minutes, the plane, the train would come. So we're standing there and just waiting. And then 
just as the doors were closing, because we knew we couldn't make it. So we just waited for that one to go off. So that just as those were closing, well, we heard somebody run past us, just whisper, so just jumped in. He nearly killed himself trying to jump on that train. My husband and I looked at each other and we just knew that, I mean, this guy is a Nigerian. Because we live in Nigeria, you live in Lagos, you will know that who I used to jump in off buses. We, we get on the bus when it's moving, we get off it when it's moving. Nobody's stopping for you in Lagos. And so it just occurred to me that, ah, this guy is a Nigerian. He didn't need to say a word. He didn't need to say anything to me. He didn't need to, he didn't need to do anything just by noticing his, his attitude, his nature, his manner, his I knew he was a Nigerian. Why? Because I'm in Nigeria. So I could recognize. I even knew he was a Lagosian because I live in Lagos, so I could recognize the Lagosian. So it's the same thing. If you're a godly person, you will recognize somebody who's godly. So when they brought Eve to him, he knew that this is the person who's supposed to go the path of destiny with me. He knew. It's just something that, but like when I said, Bible says deep cause will be, there's something. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my own story because some people will hear this story, um, the first story, the first marriage story, and immediately think that, oh, God just, at that time, just say, mm, this guy needs somebody, so let me just make it. I believe that if you understand the nature of God, you understand that God doesn't do things haphazardly. He doesn't just do things um sporadic like i don't i don't have anything to do let me just make let me just make a little girl so that i can give it to adam no god had a plan god saw the needs that adam had and he he knew how do i know this jeremiah 1 9 says that before i formed you in your mother's womb i knew you i even called you a prophet of the nation so god already had an assignment before jeremiah was made not born, made. He said, before I formed you. So even before Eve was formed, God already knew what she was going to fulfill. He already knew the assignment and the purpose for which he was making her. So that's why I know that God doesn't want you to just marry anybody. I believe that God has someone that he has in mind for you. So I'll share a little bit of my story. This guy, he was a doctor, um, by the, time, by the time we were planning to get married, um, he was off to do his master's in the UK. We had done our introduction. So we're just waiting. He, he was going to do his one year um, in the UK. I was going to do my one year in Unilag, and then we'd come back, do our wedding, and then we'd move to the UK. So I had my plans. I'd sorted my life out. Um, and then one morning, um, I was about to go to, I was about to go, I had lectures in school, so I was about to go to school. And that morning, I just had this strong nudging from God. I knew that God wanted to speak to me. Um, and that's because I already have a habit and a culture of talking to God. So I know when it is God, you know. I, it wasn't that I was praying God to show me to my room, to my room. I knew that God wanted to speak to me. And I didn't even know what it was about. So I spent my time um, focused on trying to, to you know, to um, spend time with God and know what he wanted to say to me. So while I was there, um, after I had worshipped and after I had worshipped for a bit, I started reading... Um, John 4, where Jesus was on his way to back to Galilee. And the um, Bible says that he, 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 he had to go through, some versions say it was necessary for him to go through Samaria. So he stopped at a city in Samaria called Sika. And while he was there, he sent his disciples to go and buy food. Um, but Jesus had a plan. That's why I say you must understand how God works. God is very intentional. He doesn't do anything just by chance. God always has a plan. So God wanted to minister to this particular woman but he knew that of course it would be intimidating if he has that i mean if you're a woman and you see 12 men 13 men 13 men or more you know 13 men standing together by a well won't you turn back early in the morning you are alone going to bed with you turn back so jesus decided to send him away to get him food so he sent them away to buy food for him and he sat at the well and the woman and jesus said to her um, please give me some water to drink and the woman said you must really be thirsty. Or are you new here? Don't you know that Jews don't talk to Samaria, the Samaritans? And then Jesus said, if you knew the generosity of God and who it is that is talking to you, I mean, this has message translation puts in, I love it so much. So if you know the generosity of God and you know the person who's talking to you, said you will ask him to give you water. And she said, you don't even have a bucket. How are you going to give me water? And says, the water that I speak of giving you is living water. And if you drink this water, you will never thirst again. And the woman said, give me this water. And it's interesting you know that in verse 14 um i think it was no verse 16 
um, when she asked for water in verse 15, say, give me this water so that I wouldn't need to come back here. And then Jesus said something to her. He said, go and call your husband. And then she said, I don't have any husband. And he said, you rightfully said, but for you've had five husbands, he says, but the man that you're with now is not your husband. And it was like somebody used a yellow highlighter to just mark that part of the Bible for me. Like I saw it clearly, like God was telling me that the man, that's how it was, the man you're with is not your husband. That's how it was written. And at first, <laughs> my head was in all, all kinds of places because I'd been in this relationship for five years. I'd done my introduction. My parents were on, on the same page with me. We were ready to get married. And then God says, the man I'm with is not my husband. But I know God enough to know that. If God is asking you to let go of something, he has something better for you. So at that time, was it easy? Of course not. And I believe this is a word for somebody. It wasn't easy for me to make that decision to let go of that relationship. Of course, there were tears on both sides, his side, my side. Because he was born again, tongue talking, loved the Lord. There was nothing wrong with him. Well, God asked me a question because I was trying to negotiate with God. I was saying, this guy is a great guy. He's romantic, he's everything. And he's a Christian. Why do you want me to let go of this thing that I think is perfect? You know, and at the time I felt he's a doctor and I was bad diagnosed with PCOS. So this guy would just help me. I mean, everything worked. And then God asked me to ask him a question. He said, ask him that if you were a pastor, would he marry you? I said, pastor. He said, just ask him. I said, ah, but this guy is born again. How can he even say no? If he's a Christian that loves the Lord, how can he say no? And so I went to him and I said, if I were a pastor, would you marry me? He said, no. He didn't miss a bit. He said, no. I said, no, well, let, me, well, let me explain to you. You know what he started explaining? <laughs> Trying to explain away something that is glaring in your eyes. I said, well, let me explain to you. Me, me, Mildred, that you love already. Me, that you want to be with. Me, that we've made plans for our future. He said, I didn't stutter. If you're a pastor, I won't marry you. And it was then it hits me that God has a bigger plan than just how you feel. And so God said to me, the real reason, he said, look at that scripture of the woman at the well. He said, when she wanted to go deeper with me, when she asked for that living water, the first thing I said was, go and call your husband. He said, because the man over your life or the person you partner with on the journey to destiny can affect whether you reach your destination. And I will never forget. He said, it's not just about who you marry. Is about what I want to do with your marriage. I had not even met Pastor Kingsley at the time. I had no dreams or plans of, oh, my marriage, I will be known as a marriage coach or I'll be known as marriage goals in quotes because I see a lot of those things these days. When I put up anything on my page, people say marriage goals. And for me, that's a big deal because my heart has always been to use my marriage as ministry, to show people that there's something God can do. No marriage is perfect, but God can make it perfect. God can help you. God can strengthen you. God can show you how to love each other. And so God said, is what I want to do with your marriage. So I said, I said one prayer. I said, God, bypass my emotions and do what is best for me because my heart was really broken at the time. But I also wanted to know what God wanted to do for me. Um, there's a scripture that I love so much, Psalm 32, verse 8 to 9, and I'm going to read it to you. And this is a scripture that really helped me at that time. And I believe that it will help someone here today. It says, I'm reading the New Living Translation. It says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and I will watch over you. It says, I will guide you along the best pathway. Meaning that there's a pathway for you, but there's the best way. So meaning that there are many godly options. Because I'm not here today to tell you that, Oh, there's one man for you, only one man that has been kept for you. I don't believe that. I believe that there are many godly options. But there's the best one. So there's God's permissive will, but there's also, I will guide you. I will advise you. I will watch over you. Trust me. So one, so along the line, I met Pastor King, but with nothing, we're just friends, nothing major. And then one day I was just praying and I said to God, the same way you told me who it's not, just so that I'm sure it's not a fluke. I know how you speak to me through the word. God speaks to me through the word on every area of my life. Clear as day. I said, it's the same way I want you to church. And then after, after service, I was reading my Bible. I was reading about where um, David was, Samuel went to anoint um, a new king. God sent him to anoint a new king. And then when he got there, um, he got to Jesse's house. Jesse brought out his first son. And he was like, surely, this is the anointed of the Lord. He saw how handsome and how big and how strong. I said, this was God's 
anointed. And God said, I don't look the way you look. I'm not seeing the way you are seeing. I see the heart. And he said to him, this is not the one. And then he brought the second brother. He said, but after a while, someone was like, do you have any more sons? He said, well, I have one. But he's the youngest and he's taking care of the sheep. And then he said, go and bring him. And when he came in, the spirit of God said to Samuel, said, arise, anoint him. But this is the one. And the same thing exactly happened. Like the same highlights happened, marked that same line. He's the youngest, he's taking care of the sheep. Arise, anoint him for his name. I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And then God asked me, he said, what position is Kingston? I said, he's the youngest in his family. He said, what do pastors do? I said, they take care of the sheep. He said, then arise and anoint him for his one. I knew like I knew my name, that that was God's perfect will for me. And so from then on, it was easy for me to know that this is what God wanted me to do. Now, on finally getting into that relationship with Pastor Kingston, what I now realized was that there were certain things that God had put in his heart that God wanted to use him to do. And God had also started to stir in my heart. So we had the same we had the same vision, but most importantly, going the same way. Listen, you would have most likely married the wrong person. I was going to marry the other guy because he was a doctor and I think that means something was wrong with me. I was going to marry, I can't say that I was as invested or I felt sent to him the way I feel sent to my husband. So at every point in time, when I think back and I look at the reasons why I wanted to marry the other guy, I knew that there were wrong reasons. And that means I would have ended up with the wrong person. But now I was doing it because God was my first reason for marrying my husband. The very first reason. The source of a thing is the sustenance. If the reason why you're marrying your husband is God, the reason why you stay in that marriage will be God, no matter the challenges that come, come against you. So God's plan is not just that you fulfill destiny, but that you will fulfill destiny together. Final thing, just before I go, the final thing that I know that God really wants for a purposeful marriage is not just both of you fulfilling destiny. Um, it's not just both of you being satisfied. It's not just of both of you doing marriage God's way, but it's also legacy. Let me read to you Malachi 2, verse 15. And that, is so, that scripture is so important because a lot of times we're only focused on how when we get married, God is going to bless us with the right person so we'll be productive. No, that's not all that matters when it comes to marriage. For God, God also wants something in mind. So I'm going to read to Malachi 2.15, and I'm going to wrap it up from there. Um, Malachi 2.15, I, I believe I still have a breakout session, so I'm going to take my time in the breakout session and talk about the things to find before you find the one, okay? The things to find before you find the one. Um, I hope you guys can still hear me, see me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so Malachi 2, verse... 15. Okay, so I'll start from um, 14. So here, what had happened was that, thank you. So what had happened was that the people were, um, were making sacrifices, giving their offerings, but it was not being received. It was not being received. And so they were crying out to God. And God was saying, do you know why I'm doing this thing? It's just simple. Because I was a witness, because God was there as a witness when you spoke your marriage vows to your young bride. And now you've broken those vows, broken the faith bond with your vowed companion and your covenant wife. Now, this is where I'm going, verse 15. It says, God, not you, made marriage. And his spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And what does he want from marriage? Children of God, that's what. So God, as much as God is happy about your synergy, he's happy about um, you fulfilling destiny, he's happy that you're living covenant marriage so there's no secrecy, God is very invested in legacy. That was the one thing God loved about Abraham. He said, I've chosen him because I know that he will train his children in his ways after him. So that the covenant will not leave your house. God is interested in God. This is, and I shared, I shared this over and over with people. We should not make the mistake of thinking when we raise moral children that we raise God. This is. What makes something godly is that it is born of God. So God wants you to, through your marriage, 
evangelize a next generation. He wants you through your marriage to preserve a next generation that will be on fire for God, that will love the Lord, will be passionate about the things of God. One of the easiest ways to pass down anything is through family. So God is interested, not just in you going out there and conquering mountains and doing those things, but in raising a next generation who will love him as much as you love him or even more. A next generation who will be on fire for him. A next generation who will be interested and invested in their worship life. So God wants godly seed. What makes something godly is that it's born of God. If your children are not born again, they're not godly. And I know a lot of parents don't like to hear this, but I really need to say this. Your children need to be born of God. Being born again is not just about changing your behavior. God changes your nature. It takes, it's not just about now being, a, being conscious of your flesh and your human side. It's being conscious of your divinity, your God nature. So God now puts his nature in your children when they become born again. So God wants you to, yes, fulfill destiny. God wants you to have synergy, yes. He wants you guys to work together as a team. He wants them not to be secrecy. But above all things, he wants legacy. He wants godly children. And God cannot raise them as godly children. He can't come down from heaven and say, this is how you're supposed to be. It is left to us. Those of us who God has already um, given us a, an encounter with him, that we're in love with him, to raise the next generation. So when you are getting married, I always ask people, your question you should ask yourself, and I think I put up a video like that today. The question you should ask yourself is, if I marry this person, do I want to reproduce after this kind? If that question is answered honestly, you will not marry an unbeliever. You will not say, oh, but he's nice. He may be nice, but is he godly? Oh, he's so sweet, but is he godly? Oh, he's so romantic. Is he godly? Is he submitted completely to God? That's the major thing that helps you make, make sure that you're working in purpose concerning marriage. Marriage is not just about how we feel. Marriage is not just about, oh, I love him. Marriage is not just about, oh, he makes me feel good. Marriage is not just about, he's very nice to me. No, marriage is about us fulfilling destiny, you having synergy, no secrecy, but above all, living a legacy. Now, I want us to pray together because I know that there's someone out there who probably is struggling with the decision of, God is saying, let go of this thing that you are in. That's not my purpose for you. Let go of this. Listen, trust me. I've seen God do this over and over again. If you are willing to let go of that, God will guide you with his eyes on the best pathway for your life so that you don't have to struggle. That woman was doing trial and error. First husband, second husband, third husband, fourth husband. She was on her fifth husband. Jesus was saying to her, you're looking for all the wrong things, the wrong things. Let me help you. I want to help you. So I want to give you a chance to encounter that same help. I don't know. I don't know if God has said, leave that relationship. If you're in a relationship with someone who's not godly, if you're in a relationship with somebody who's not born of God, that's the first place to stop. Just pack it up. If you haven't discovered what it is that God wants you to do, how will you know who to go with you? The only way to fulfill purpose in marriage is to have the first right relationship, and that's what we us. You must have a relationship with God. So I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. And it's not even a prayer of salvation because I believe that most of us are born again here, but I will still give you an opportunity to do that. But I want to pray with you more importantly, that you live your life fully in the will and purpose and plans that God has for you. And the only way to do that is to be sold out completely to God. I make, I mean no words when it comes to how I love God. I love him and whatever he says to me, my answer is yes. So I want that to be the relationship you have with him. So I want to pray with you today that you walk in the fullness of what it is that God has called you to do. So I just want to say simple and very quick prayer with me. Very simple, very quick. The prayer that is you're going to say, God, open my eyes and my ears that I will know when I'm walking in your perfect way. That's the simple prayer I want you to pray today. And I know that that will change everything for you. Sometimes God will say yes. Sometimes he will say no. Sometimes he will say not yet. But if you are hearing, you will walk in the right path. If you are seeing, you walk in the right path. And you know how God operates. The Bible says that you have your teachers in front of you, but you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. You won't turn to the left. You won't miss it. That's what it's simply saying. So I want you to pray that simple prayer with me. Say, God, I want seeing eyes, hearing ears. And I want a heart that understands your perfect will and plan concerning marriage. So let's say that prayer together. 
Makada ya bosha tali ya mande deisa. Ingra tu shekele ya branda kagise de bosha ta. Ingra toza da ya le mando kosa. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for myself and everyone here. Lord, that we will have seen eyes and hearing ears. And we will have a heart that understands your perfect will, your perfect plans, your perfect purpose for us. I know that your word says that you will guide us with your eyes. You say we should not be stubborn like the meal that we will need to be pulled by beat and on. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will cause us to be malleable in your hands, that we will be meek. Because you say in the meek you will guide in judgment. Everyone that is in a wrong relationship, Lord, I ask for grace for them to end it today in the name of Jesus. I pray that their hearts will be sold out to you. I pray that they will not listen to the voice of men rather than to your voice in the name of Jesus. They will not be moved by emotions. They will not be moved by family manipulation. They will not be moved by emotional blackmail. They will set their faces like a flint. They will not be moved. They will obey only your will and your plan for their life in the name of Jesus. I pray that your hand will be mighty upon them. I pray for also everyone who is struggling in mind, trying to find what it is that they're supposed to achieve together. They're trying to find synergy. They're trying to find intimacy. Lord, I ask that there be healing in their homes in the name of Jesus so they will be able to walk together to create a legacy for you, to leave children that love you and want to serve you all the days of their life in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for this time together. Thank you for this word. For I know that you will still take it, you will break it, you will bless it, and you will multiply it to the thousands of people that will hear this in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you were blessed. I trust God that you got the word that God has for you this afternoon. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Pastor Mildred. That was an amazing session. So we're going to go into our question and answer session. And I'm just going to let everyone know there are a few ways you can ask questions. So you can use the raise your hand function. Um, it depend, depends on where, what device you're using. Please look for the raise your hand function. You can send a question to the chat or you can send a message privately. So please look for tone O if you would like to send me a direct message and I will read out the question to Pastor Mildred. So we'll alternate between reading questions. And if you would like to speak, um, you can raise your hand and then the media team will unmute you. So Pastor, before we begin, we act I actually have a, a question already that we can start with while others think about their questions. And we have about 40 minutes for questions. So the question is, how do I move on from a relationship of six years? And God has told you the man is not the one, but I'm struggling to move on because I feel more comfortable with him and have never had such connection with any other person. It's, it's honestly, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that happened to me. Um, yours is six years, so you're one year over at the time you should be there. <laughs> um, so I, I struggle with it. And like I said, I can't say to you that it was easy, but when you have made up your mind to please God, rather than anything else, your emotions, yourself, even the man, um, it becomes a bit easier. Um, you need to, um, you need to ask yourself why you're struggling with it. For me, one of the reasons I was struggling with it was I just felt like I'm not, like I'm not, I don't think I can do this again. Like start with someone else. I don't think I can do the whole long dating thing. And I'm already used to this guy. I understand him. I understand his nuances. I understand his likes and his likes. I just felt like I'm okay with this. And I felt like this was the best thing. So the real problem is that you think this is the best thing. But every time when it comes to God, God's best is never in the now. It's always in the future. If God, if God is asking you to live off something, I guarantee you that there's something better ahead. So maybe what you need to do is forget the things that are behind you. Forget the former things of old and embrace the fact that God is about to do a new thing. And with God, it's always better. There's never a better last year. So that might be what would encourage you. And then maybe have an accountability partner, someone that you know will um, help you make that decision to break it and keep checking up on you that you don't go back to um, the relationship again. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is, what do you think about mentors, um, relationship mentors or marriage mentors and how do you go about finding one? Okay, what do I think about it? Um, I, am, I am a relationship mentor, so I probably have only positive things to say about it. Um, but I do think you should be careful when you're picking a marriage mentor. Um, you can pick one if you're in a church. You can pick a couple who you um, 
you respect, you like their marriage because basically when you pick a mentor, what you're saying is you want to reproduce after their kind. You, know, you want to be like them. So you want to pattern your home and entrust your marriage into their hands with the kind of counsel that you give. So you have to be sure that they're, they're godly, first of all. You have to also be sure that they practice um, what they're teaching you and that you see results. Um, another thing is for us in our church, um, Davis Christian Center, one of the things we do is that your counselors are your marriage mentors for life. So we're very careful about that relationship. So if you assign a counselor before you get married, they are marriage counselors for life. So they literally have to mentor you through everything, childbearing, everything, any issues, you just go back to them. So um, I would say be careful. People have to be godly. You have to be sure the kind of counsel they have. They need to know what they're saying. Um, I would really like if they're trained, um, either they're trained counselors or they're just people that older couples that you really respect their marriage and all that. So, um, I think that's an easy way to go about it. But it's a good idea if you ask me because you avoid some of the mistakes that they may have made because they'll be open with you to tell you this is how to do it or not. Okay. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, so I'm going to move on to the next question. How do you separate God's voice saying, uh, how do you separate God's voice saying leave from the devil trying to keep you from the right partner? Um, so I guess if you gotta, are you, how are you sure it's the devil not trying to prevent you from who God has for you? Okay, so um, I think that we give Satan more power than, we credit him with more power than he really has. Um, Bible says that my sheep hear my voice. Um, the voice of a stranger they will not hear. So the question is not how do you separate, it's whether you are sheep. If you are sheep, you will hear his voice, you will recognize it. Um, also, have you ever heard God in any other area or is it just when it comes to marriage, you're trying to hear him? I've heard God in many areas. So marriage was not the first time and I already knew the pattern with which God speaks to me. Sp spoke to me the same way when it was time to have children because I didn't have my children in time. Um, I, I battled with infertility for about eight years as well. And um, from the time I was 16, I already knew. Doctors had told me I would not have children. So I knew when God was speaking to me, when he was telling me what to do, because I wanted to go the medical route and God kept saying no. So I knew, and he said in the same way he told me my regime, what is in the scriptures, that when they say, go to the fortune tellers, tell them, no, I'm going to study the scriptures. He said, those that go try other means get nowhere. Um, he said to me, your salvation will come from total dependence on me. So stop your silly efforts to save yourself. These are all written in the Bible, clear as day. There are scriptures like that. So even with my exams, when I was a student in school, he, he, he said to me, I just, it just clicked one day that I have the mind. He said, let the mind, this mind that I was in Christ be in you. So there's a mind Christ has. So if Christ's mind is in me, that means I can write an exam and not fail. If Jesus will write an exam, will he fail? I have more understanding than my teachers. So I knew that when they teach me, I will have more. Like scriptures come alive to me. So I, knew, I know how God speaks to me. So how does God speak to you? Has he spoken to you about anything else? Have you, these things are, are exercised through use. The more you hear God, the more you know how to hear God. The more you spend time with the person, the more you know their voice. If you hang around me a bit, you will know how I talk. You will know the kind of things that I can say. So it's the same thing. And then thankfully, we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is the Bible. So if there's anything you are hearing, contrary to what is written in the word, contrary to God's nature that he has shown us from his word, then I'll say, don't take it, just throw it away. Awesome, thank you very much, Ma. Okay, brother, also has a question. Um, please go ahead. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the teaching. Um, my question is, if two people who they are sure that, okay, God has said this is the person for you and they are sure, can they get married if they, the important parties are not like agreeing for the marriage? That is, their parent, both parties' parents are not in agreement. In fact, majority of, ma majority of the people they know are not in agreement. It's only maybe their pastors or something that, that are in agreement with the marriage, but the rest are not in agreement with the marriage. Should they go ahead with the marriage or they should you know, hold it? Okay, so thank you, Osama. Uh, that's a bit dicey. However, um, it's not an uncommon question. Um, what I would say is this. You have two sets of parents. You have spiritual parents, you have natural parents. If your natural parents are saying no, and your spiritual parents are saying yes, then I would kind of work with my spiritual parents to try to convince my natural parents, or at least find out 
why my natural parents are saying no. Um, the, I, the other question I would ask is why? Why is everyone saying no? Um, well, how is it possible that no one can say, okay, but you see your spiritual parents are saying yes. But I would like to find out why. Why is this happening on this side and not happening on the other side? Um, what are the reasons? Sometimes it's tribal, and we all know that that doesn't really hold water because they're good, good, they're good marriages in every tribe and they're bad marriages. Um, sometimes it's emotional. Maybe they're not just ready for you guys to go and then they have different excuses. Or maybe one side was even okay or indifferent about it and then they hear the other side is saying no, then they're like, so why we say yes? So I've seen all kinds of drama, really. I've seen all kinds of drama. I can't say there's a one-size-fits-all answer to this, but if your parents, um, your natural parents are still saying no, your spiritual parents are saying yes, and you have tried everything, you have tried to wait it out, you have prayed, you've spoken to them, you've gotten their own pastors to speak to them, and they're still saying no, and you're doing, you're doing everything you need to do, you've done everything you need to do, you waited maybe like two or three years. Um, Therefore, shall a man, you know, so there has to be maturity. You have to make that decision by yourself and own it. So if you're deciding to go ahead with it, it has to be a decision you can own. But I would, if both your parents, your spiritual and natural are saying, no, I wouldn't go ahead with it, to be honest. I wouldn't. Um, I don't think you should. But if one party is saying yes and the other is saying no, then let them have a conversation. Let them... Let them have a conversation and try to meet in the middle and let you know why they're saying no. Having said that, my husband has a book called I Love You, but my parents say no. If you can find that book, we may have more answers for you. Thank you, Mara. The next question is, I believe I am with the, I believe the person I'm in a relationship with is a will of God. But he keeps asking me to send semi-nude pictures and this makes me very uncomfortable. Does this mean I do not hear God right? and he's not God's will for me. Okay. Um, me I, I, I think I said this, but I need to establish it again. Um, I don't believe that there's only one person in this world for you. I think God gives you many godly options. So you must understand that people also have free will. So maybe this is even God's original intention that, oh, this is the person you should marry. Like, oh, I think you guys will be a great match. God is saying, I'm presenting her. But if he comes to you, the same way God brought lions to Adam, and he comes to you and he's just making you uncomfortable with some of the things he's doing, then you may have to call him what he should be. So you will call him, oh, friend, and let him move on and trust God to give you a better option, okay? Um, anything that makes you uncomfortable, anything that makes you sin against God, I would, I would, so at some point, maybe God even said that one we both has been said in the past. I don't even think that the guy I was with before was not necessarily who God wanted me to marry. I just think that his heart could not carry where God was taking me. I don't, like I said, he's a good, he was a good Christian. He was romantic, was everything. When I met my husband, I was even romantic. We had to work at it. You know, my husband's kind of, the person I was dating before, the kind of person that would send me love notes on a daily, send me flowers for no reason, open doors, pull out chairs, send me mixtapes, you know, that kind of thing. I just said mixtapes, so everybody knows my age, you know, those kind of things. And when I met my husband, we were going somewhere and I said to him, you can't open the door. He said, what's into your hand? Those were his exact words. Are you invalid? <laughs> and I was like, see, this very, I, I used to call him unromantic and then I graduated, you are now aromatic. You know, we used to tease each other about it. But today, after 16 years, my husband is one of the most romantic men I know because every time I said something, he listened, he changed. But that is not something as fundamental as disobeying God. He's asking you to send nudes. The God that sent you there, do you think God will be happy to see you send nudes? I mean, there's some things we should just draw the line sometimes. You don't even need God to answer this question. You yourself should say, God, this person you sent to me, he said it's not correct, I can't keep up. You can't send him away. So I don't think you should stay there under the guise that you think this is God's will for you. God has many godly options. He has many good sons. So if this one fails to um, comply with what God's plan is, God is not going to force him. God is not going to force him. So I would say, please do not send me and let have that conversation with him that I can't do this with you. If you're not going to do it God's way, I'm not interested in this relationship. And draw the line, you know. Women must have standards. You must have standards. You must 
if you if you if you how they say that thing if you if you don't fall if you don't stand for something you fall for anything so you, you must know where to draw the line why does he even think it's okay to ask you to send news i i mean why does he think it's okay there's a there's an there's an aura you have that people can tell you that kind of rubbish can i imagine myself someone saying send, send me news why <laughs> why you know so i think you should have that conversation and decide what you want and then walk around that if you know you don't want a guy that said, I don't care whether you hear trumpets and angels and curtains shaking and lights flickering, and you say, this is the man for you. There are some things that God will not take himself. So we'll walk away from that if you ask me what you know. Thank you very much, Ma. The next question, how do you and your partner figure out what your collective purpose in marriage is? Hmm, conversations. So we have conversations and then we pray. Simple. Very simple. Just ask God, <laughs> you know, people just want to make everything deep and dramatic. Just ask God. You brought us together. Why? You know, so my husband and I had to do that. And then we had conversations. This is what we liked, what we would like to do. And then we came up with a collective vision. This is what we both think God is saying to us. And this is what I would have liked to do individually. And we then we put it together and we're working as a team. And every, every now and then we pray together again just to be sure that we're still in line with what, what God has asked us to do. Simple. Thank you. Ma. The next question, when God, God told you who your husband was, did he meet all your specifications or did he have any weaknesses? Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. It was everything I did not want, interestingly. So I had these idols. I call them idols now, but I had these crazy idols in my head. So there were certain things I told God, I did not want. This was something I'd always said to God. It was a conversation we've always had. So number one, I did not want to marry a pastor or a deacon or a lay minister or someone who hangs out with pastors, but I just didn't want that. So I didn't want the pastor life. I knew that it was a life of sacrifice and I wasn't sure I was ready for that. I also knew that pastor's wives were stereotyped and I wasn't ready for that. I didn't want anybody to um, try to dictate who I was going to be how I was going to be and just totally changed me from who I am. And I, like I said, they're idols, so they're just wrong notions and this is really true. Um, so I had issues with that. I didn't want to marry a pastor. I also didn't want to marry an evil man because I felt they were arrogant. Um, and I would often hear people say things like, oh, evil men take care of their wives. But I only felt they took care of their wives just to brag. You know. <laughs> <laughs> just had weird things. Um, I also, an evil man would have a conversation. I mean, if you're Nigerian, you know what I mean. I have a conversation and everyone is listening on it. Hello, where are you go? I'm like, can't you just tone down your voice? Like, I just couldn't. Um, I also had the issue of every December, they would go back to their village and I am such a city girl, God. I don't believe how snobbish I'm sounding, but <laughs> those were crazy notions I had back then. Like, I'm a city girl. I don't want to go to the village. I don't. And I don't want to go to the stream. I don't think it's fun. I don't like rural life. I don't. I don't want to go to everybody's house. And I'm very private. I don't want that. You know. I just don't. I'm not going to enjoy it. So I had a conversation with God that even though I'm ego and I'm ego, <laughs> so you can imagine, I just knew that this was not for me. So just give me one really nice house, a boy or your bad boy, and I'm good, Lord. Or even give me an, even even if he's white, I don't care. But just give me an ego man. Um, I also did not want a man that was hairy because I'm very hairy and I just felt God, my children. I also wasn't attracted to men who were fair in complexion. I just, and to be honest, all these things, God just rolled them all up together and said, my darling, here you go. And so I ended up with a man who was a pastor, who is evil, who is extremely hairy, who is, who used to be fair in complexion, the Lagos son has dealt with him. Um, and all of those things were wrapped, on, wrapped up together in a really good heart, a good heart and he was a great friend and so when I wait I can't let go of this this friendship he was my friend like I could talk to him about things I couldn't even tell my ex like I could talk to him about everything and I wouldn't feel judged I wouldn't feel shame I wouldn't feel anything I just I could be naked and really not be ashamed you know that's how I felt with him so when I weighed that I realized all these things they can change they're not important um December is when pastors are most busy, so we don't travel to the village. My husband is not, he's more Yoruba than he's even Yoruba. He speaks Yoruba well, doesn't kick people well. Um, the complexion changed, which I regret now. Um, 
Harry now beard gang is reigning, so I mean, now so it's really good for me. Uh, um, God taught me that I can, he can, I don't want to make space. And sometimes I'm just an internet queue. It's as simple as that, you know. And God is using me that way. I want to use you just the way you are. Um, we're going to be a hindrance. God, would you rather have a friend or not? Would you rather have a, I just choose friendship and love over looks and all that. So, so it was definitely not everything you needed. Uh, thank you, Ma. Follow-up question. So how did you deal with any weaknesses that, quote-unquote, he had, as a, rather than the packaging? Oh, okay. So um, first of all, you must understand that different personalities always attract. So that's the law in marriage. Different people attract. I mean, my husband is very extroverted. I'm very extroverted, completely. Um, my husband is, he likes um, to be spontaneous. I'm very planned out and detailed. And spontaneity kind of stresses me out. Um, my husband likes to advise that another one. Um, my husband is, he doesn't really, I don't want to say he's never on time, but he's never on time. Um, <laughs> so he's the last person on the plane, always the last. And I have to be the first at the airport. So a little, those kind of things, and this stressed me out a lot. But what I realized is that there are three stages in marriage. So there's the attraction stage. Then of course, there's the frustration stage. And then there's the exchange stage. That's the third stage. Usually most people don't survive the frustration stage. They either get a divorce or you start to hear, I'm done, I can't handle it. Or they log out, they become detached. So I build my own world apart from him. Um, so what I did was we had a lot of conversations, number one, we talked. And that's mostly what marriage is about. You teach each other how to love each other. I tell people that all the time. I can give you tips and tools and everything, but ultimately you may know that. So I had to teach him some certain things. So my husband is the kind of person that would never apologize for anything. He would just play with you. Um, so if he annoys you he's, or does something that's hurtful, he'll just come in maybe a few minutes later or a few hours later and just start tickling you or something. I'm apologize. Just say you're sorry, you know. And that just doesn't want you to apologize when you're offending. He wants you to just go and change. So his approach is go and see more. I'm like, well, how do you know I'm even sorry for what I did? So it doesn't matter if you've changed, then I know you were sorry. So we have to have a conversation. And you know what? We have to meet halfway. You have to, I want to hear the words. Say, I'm sorry, then change, okay? And then if you don't want me to apologize, because it's like, no, stop telling me you're sorry, just change. We will work that out for you. So we have to have conversations like that, you know, that helps both of us. So talk to each other about your weaknesses, then pray. So what I started doing was I started praying. In fact, um, I have a book called Praying for Your Husband, which is basically a compilation of the prayers I prayed for my husband over the last 16 years. Um, and they're simple prayers, but they had such a huge impact on my mind. Because what happened was that even though I was praying about my husband, God now taught me how to pray for him. So God taught me how to not complain about him every time in prayer, but to declare what I wanted him to do. So I started praying about the things I wanted to see. One, the first thing that happened was that God started to change me. So I was praying about him to change, but God started to change me. Um, it changed my perspective. I started seeing my husband more the way God sees him. So I would complain about something. God would say, but that's, that's who he is. Are you really? So if he never changes, are you telling me you can't love me? I'm like, wow. I say, yes. So accept him. Accept him first. And so that's what I started doing. God started changing me. Started making me more patient. Started making me more tolerant. And you must understand that God also started showing me the fact that I'm not perfect as well. So God started changing some things in me that I thought he was causing. But it was really me. I was the problem. So God started changing me. And then, I mean, the little changes that needed to be done in him, God now started changing that as well. So prayer and conversations really helped us. Thank you, Mara.
All right, the next question, and then Brother Osinachi, I'll come to you is, you said that two are better than one, but I have never really been interested in marriage and I have great aspirations I would like to achieve. Will I struggle to achieve those if I don't get married? Not necessarily, um, not necessarily. Um, the scripture in, I think it's Matthew 11, so I'm not sure now. Um, I wish I thought about this, I would have found the scripture for you guys. Um, that says that not everyone is meant to be married. Jesus said that some, some will not marry because they don't want to. Some will not marry because nobody asked them. Some will not marry because um, of ministry. That's the life they're called to. Um, so not everyone. Apostle Paul achieved a lot and he did not get married. So it depends on what God's plan is for your life. Um, it's like saying that um, there's heavy load in front of you. If you had someone to help you carry it, of course you'd be able to carry it. But then if there's no one to carry it, then God will make you stronger. So I think that if you get married, it may be easier, may not. Some people will get distracted. Anymore. But I think that either way, God will make you strong enough and give you the grace to fulfill um, everything that you're called to do. So marriage is not necessarily um, the, um, I don't know the word to use now, it's not really the determining factor on whether you, you fulfill your, your goals. Jesus did not marry and he still fulfilled everything he was meant to fulfill. However, God says it's not good, meaning it can be better. It doesn't mean it's not good at all. Like it can be better if you have someone to help you. you know? Like you go after a hard day's work, you come home to, even if she's not helping you do the work, you come home to a good home cooked meal, a hug and a prayer and some good conversation. Trust me, you feel better than when you come home and you just put earphones in and listen to music <laughs> you know so i think that you will still fulfill your destiny but um except you're if you're called to marry you will know if you're called not to marry you will also know you will know thank you Ma. brother Oshana, you please go ahead praise the lord um thank you pastor mildred um for your uh, for blessing us so far, by the way, I'm an evil man. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> it's okay. For there. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so this is my question, man. Um, when, when uh, you you have somebody or God is leading you to somebody, and you know that this is, I mean, like you 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 know that this is God's plan for your life, and you can see that. Um, purpose, I mean, God, the purpose that God has called you for is aligned to this person or this brother or this sister. But then um, you, you, you notice certain characteristics, trait, or character flaws, if I would say, um, that um, it's, it's difficult for you to handle or deal with. And, um, you know, you always hear this thing that people say, um, Yes, well, we, we, we saw it before marriage, but right, we didn't pay attention to it and then it's causing problems after the marriage. Um, so is it what, what do you do in that what do you do in that uh, in, in that situation? I mean, do you just keep praying about it until things change or is it an indication that maybe God has somebody else better or what do you do? Okay, so um if we if we constantly have to walk away from work, from helping people to be better. I, mean, I don't think there'll, there'll be anybody good in the world. So let me say this. So when my husband met me, I used to be very shy, like completely introverted. So I used to be very shy. Um, and I was very content, very, very content to do behind the scenes work, to help his ministry, write his books, stand behind, write his books, put his name on it, um, you know, organize church, do everything. I always used to do everything behind the scenes. And um, at some point, my husband kept saying to me, you are too gifted to stand behind me. I need you to stand beside me. He kept saying that. Um, and then he started doing something. So we'd be in church and then maybe he has to preach three, three services. And he just said to me, you know what? I'm exhausted. I'm leaving. Like, Who's going to preach? You. And he did that a couple of times. He just throw me, throw me into it. And I would come home really upset. Why would you do this to me? And then people start sending messages. Oh, we're so blessed. Oh, we're so blessed. And he said, this is what I'm saying to you. You're too gifted to stand behind me. You have to stand beside me. 
I used to be very hot tempered in front of my husband because I'm introverted. I implode. So if something happens, I internalize. I don't, I used to be like that. Like I wouldn't say anything. I wouldn't be vocal about it. I would internalize. I would internalize. At some point, something broke. I just felt after a while, why am I allowing myself to be bullied? Why am I? And I said, become violent. Okay, so I would I wouldn't just use the words. I was fighting, literally fighting. Um, so when I met my husband, I still I, God had helped me deal with it, but I still had little traces. You know, someone would do something and I'm so upset. I'd be so upset. I'd be like, God, I'm ah, just give me an opportunity to break this place. Said, <laughs> my husband would be like, you know, you can't get myself again. All those days are over. So what are you going to do? So he would talk me down, talk me through it. Imagine my husband didn't have the patience. And now, even if you do anything, I, I'm so. I'm so different. Like, no matter what people do, I just let it go. I've learned how to just let it go. Let it go. I heard my husband say that so much that it has become a thing for me. That's why I let it go. No matter what people do. Imagine my husband just left me and said, no, because of this, I'm not going to marry this girl. He won't reap the benefits of what we enjoy today just because he wasn't patient enough to help me deal with anger issues or help me deal with my shyness and insecurity. So what am I saying in essence? What I'm saying in essence is this. If you feel that this is the, the girl that God has called you to, I would say probably if you if you're friends, you know, you have not started a relationship, you're friends, try to help her, try to get her to get some help, whatever it is. If you've started a relationship, I wouldn't say walk okay, away from it. I would say get some counseling. If you get some proper premarital counseling, those things people say that we saw it, but we thought it would be away, they ignored it. Now, if you confront it, you can address it and you can deal with it. So if, for instance, um, she has funny issues about money, you can deal with it in counseling. Or she has issues about submission. Uh, why would it matter to me? Any other? We can deal with it in counseling. Um, if she has sexual experiences it can be dealt with in counseling i would say get counseling together get proper both of you and help you walk through the chain that are already evident but you are not saying what you love you can't even bring up those things so i would say get into some maybe maybe not even premarital counseling maybe even some clarity sessions i have some in, in our ministry we do some like love this and marriage that's what it's called we do some clarity sessions we talk to the couple and just know is this even a good fit is this you should you guys be together should you walk away from this should you you know, so I, I have a I have a couple who we talked to a couple of months ago, and the girl came to us because she wanted to know if she wanted to remain in that relationship, whether she should be with the guy, and we found that that the guy was dealing with some addictions. Okay, so his own weakness was addictions. Supposed to be a Christian, but he had addictions, which he had gotten from a roommate in school, medical school. They're both in medical school. And she, on the other hand, I found out, and this is what I said to her, you both have addictions. The guy has addictions to drugs, but you have an addiction to him. Because every time they, they've been breaking up, they've been at it for seven years, we kept breaking up and coming back. She couldn't let go. I said, why can't you let go? Are you ready to be an addict's wife? You know, you are addicted to him. So just having that clarity session, in between, we found out he was high. So in between those clarity sessions, we're able to tell her, oh, okay, this isn't good. We told the guy, you need to get help. So it's not necessarily always marriage counseling. Sometimes it's just some clarity sessions. So I think get into counseling. Yeah, thank you very much. That would help. Thank you. We only have a few minutes left. So does the right person at the wrong time exist? Or because God is omnipresent, omnipresent would he know me know forever? I, I think that you can't put God in a box. I think that you can't really answer that question for God. I think I think that God can do anything. So yeah, it's possible that you meet the right person at the wrong time. Or I wouldn't say meet the right person at the wrong time. You start the relationship at the wrong time. Sometimes people start too early and that messes up the relationship. They're not mature to something. So I think what is to my work. Wait till you're both mature. Um, and work together through it. So yeah, I think that's possible. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay, my final question, uh, Sister Rosalind, I see your hand is up, please go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just wanna say thank you so much, Pastor Mildred, for um, your contributions, your teachings today. Um, I know a lot of us are learning 
um, and we'll keep learning. So just, just really thank you. Um, but today, like I'm married. However, I have a lot of single friends, a lot of single Christian friends. And my question is really like everything that you said, um, there might be some ladies on the call today that might be single and are asking, okay, I would like to implement all these things. I would like to meet this guy. I would like to drop um, my ridiculous expectations in my mind and all of that, that are on this call and they wanna do all these things. However, we've had a pandemic for almost two years. Uh, I know in Canada, people are like locked inside, like in Alberta, for instance, we've gone back to restrictions one, like stage one, right? You can't leave the house, you can't do anything. So really my question is how do um, people single Christian girls or even single Christian brothers, how do you meet another person? How do you engage? Um, how do you basically put yourself out there in a very Christian, godly way without really like lowering your standards in any shape or form? Okay, great question. Um, I mean, things have really changed in the last one year. Things have really, really changed. So of course, before the answer to this question would really be simple, you know, um, be at the right places at the right time, you know, be among friends, make you know, he that must have friends and show himself friendly. So get friends, um, talk to people. Um, sometimes even a friend will recommend a friend, hang out with people, just stuff like that. But a lot of that has changed. Um, so now, unfortunately, we are um, thrown into doing it online. And the danger for me, okay, um, is the fact that you really can't tell, you can't really tell a person through text. So for instance, I'm going to be talking to you and you say something funny that hurt me, funny to you, but hurtful to me. And I just write LOL and you think I'm laughing, but I'm not. So you can't really tell you know, a person's real heart through text or, you know, things like that. So it still goes back to the same thing I said before about hearing God. I think if you have a relationship with God, he can direct you. So for me, let me, I'm going to end again with my story. Um, I wasn't very outgoing. So I had dated this guy for five years. We met, I was about leaving school, like two weeks leaving university um, that he proposed to me and then we started a relationship. Um, and so I was with him five years. So I didn't really, I wasn't really outgoing. I wasn't the kind of person that would be very involved in church. I was in children's church because it was less stressed for me. Um, I didn't have too many friends. But when God wanted to do it, interestingly, Pastor Kingsley and I went to secondary school together. So, and we never talked when, when, when we were in secondary school because I was born again and he wasn't. He was a bad boy in school. He was one of the bad boys, always carrying pistols, all those kind of things, or did all the bad things. They were smoking, drinking. He was a bad boy. So he was a danger to me, like, stay away. Don't have anything to do with him. Um, but after, after we left school, he got born again. I got born in school, but he got born again after we left school. Um, after after you, I'd finished university, I have I had served, I started working, everything, when I met him again. And I met him 10 years. We were, we were about to do our school our secondary school 10 year reunion, okay? So he felt a leading to organize it. So he was calling everyone and that's how we got talking again. Oh, we'd like you to bake the cake. We know you're baking, blah, blah, blah. So we made the cake. Because I made the cake, I had to show up. I wasn't going to get and started talking. So in the case of, in fact, the first time we actually really met, because he had called me on the phone, because was calling everyone, you know, do you remember that? And they did all that, but I wasn't, I wasn't really interested and I wasn't going to go. Um, but they had a meeting on my streets, a few houses down from my father's house. And I didn't go for the meeting. Like I said, I'm very introverted, so I'm always in my house. So I didn't go for the meeting. And after someone said, oh, Mildred lives down the road, so everyone packs themselves in my house. And unfortunately, there's no light. We live in Nigeria. We know that's the thing. Um, so there was no light. It was dark. And I thank God there was no light because I had just losing braids. And if you know anything about losing braids, you know that you don't look good once you lose losing braids. My hair was a mess. Everything was a mess. And I was standing out there. And they came. Where the conversation was completely pitch black. He didn't see my face. I didn't see his face. But he said he heard me talk and he loved the way that I sounded. And he said to himself, well, I'm going to 
investigate this relationship. And then that's how we became friends. But I was in a relationship, so I wasn't thinking about it. So we just became friends once in a while. Hey, hello, how are you? What's up? And that was it. So God orchestrated our meeting through the reunion. God can do it anyway. What you need to do is trust God that he will guide you with his, he will guide you promise so take him at his word he says none shall lack her mates for his spirit will gather them together i believe it absolutely so trust god to connect you with the person he wants to connect you to adam was the only person they got still found a way, a way to get a wife to him so in this world in this crazy lockdown god can still find a way to connect you with the right person so i hope that helps <laughs> thank you Thank you very much. Uh, so I apologize. I know there are a lot more questions, but we've come to the end of the question and answer session. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor Mildred. Uh, your words have been very impactful. Pastor Mildred has a website. I've sent it, uh, sent it in the chat to everyone. So um, please take a look at her website. Uh, you can also follow her on um, Instagram. She has a lot of videos on YouTube as well. So I would like to, I'd like to call on Pastor Fatoko to please round up and pray for Pastor Mildred. Oh, thank you so much for your time, Pastor Mildred. Um, yes, I know you have to go on behalf of Yaz in Canada. would like to thank you so much. It's very, it's a very thank powerful you, sir. session. Thank you, thank you very much. It's been a very, very powerful session and uh, we were really blessed. And we know we're going to see you again or we're probably going to reach out to you more when it comes to this more and more of this relationship. And so we're just going to pray for you before you leave. I know you have another ministration in the next few minutes. So let's just pray. Our Father and our God, well, thank you so much for your daughter that you brought to us today. Thank you so much for the way you have used that to impact our lives. Thank you for the words you have given to us through her. And we ask that, Father God, these words will impact our life, it will impact our mindset, and it will transform us into that person you want us to be in our marriages, oh God. And Father, we commit Pastor Midrell into your hands, oh God, as she goes into the next assignment given to her today. Let your presence go with her. Let your grace be multiply, multiplied upon her. The Father God, you're using her to impact generation. The Father God, she will not reduce in grace. But Father, she'll grow more and more and more in you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father God, you will guide our marriages Father, you guide our children as well. You guide our husband. And Father, you will prosper them in your in, in you, God, in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray that God, you open doors unto her. And Father God, you have called her to do. Father, she will fulfill it. She will finish well in the name of Jesus. Thank you so much, Almighty God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So much, ma'am. Thank, Thank you so much. Ma Thank you so much. Hopefully thank we'll be in touch again. Thank, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you. My good guys, thank you, okay. thank, thank, you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. I will. Thank Bye, you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, man. Thank you, Pastor M. Bye. <laughs> All right, so we're not done. Um, we're actually we have another um, we have another segment. So we're actually going to. Uh, we're going to be broken up into different groups and we're going to be discussing a question. So the media team is going to just break you into, um, into different breakout rooms. You don't have to do anything. Uh, so the question I would like us to discuss is, what if I'm getting older and I feel like God is leading me to a sister or a brother, but I haven't quite figured out what my purpose is. Do I need to wait until my purpose is clear or can I go ahead? Basically, is it okay to proceed in marriage even though I'm not sure what my purpose is? Okay, so uh, media team is going to break us into groups very soon. And just as you go, please just note that I would like one or two people to talk about what they talked, what they, to say what they, discuss what they talked about in their breakout room. So please just keep that in mind. we go. Okay, and I see a question. Will the recording be posted somewhere? I am, I will get back to you hopefully before we, we're done today about that question.
need you, let's go. Uh, so, so you'll be moved in shortly, <laughs> just making sure the breakout session leaders are in the right groups. So just give me a second. Okay. And uh, Zulu reps on the on this uh, on this Zoom meeting. So if you find yourself in a room that doesn't have a leader, just please just take charge. And uh, all you would need from you is to get gather the points, and you come back um, after twenty minutes to discuss what was said in your group. And uh, Sister Sister Tone will, will anchor that session. God bless. Okay, so you have twenty minutes. Welcome back, welcome back. Welcome back. Uh, so room, uh, room leaders, please turn on your cameras and uh, you'll be spotlighted. So hopefully you get ready with your, with your points. And uh, I will hand over back to your sister, Adetou. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming back. Hope you had great discussion. Um, so I'm just going to call on a few people. I might not call on everyone, um, so, but just be prepared. Uh, so if I can start with Brother Osinachi, because I see him. <laughs> Please, just in a minute or two, can you just talk about what you discussed in your room? Oh, praise God. Uh, we, uh, we had quite an interesting session in my group. Uh, and a couple of things were said, but first of all, well, we had two main views, right? Obviously, uh, the first was, uh, I had someone that thought that you have to absolutely know your purpose first, like purpose before marriage. Um, like if you don't know your purpose, you have no business getting into marriage. But then there's a diff there's another school of thought. You know, based off of what Pastor PK taught us yesterday, there's some people, it's, uh, God deals with them on the sea as you go basis, right? So he gives them a little bit of a hint. And then as they go, go, go forward in marriage, um, they begin to see um, the full manifestation of that purpose, right? But then the question was asked, uh, this is where I'll end it. The question was asked that most people that, I mean, or, or something was raised that most people that, uh, do not narrow down their purpose before marriage, most of them end up not fulfilling purpose because they get encumbered with, you know, the vicissitudes of life, you know, raising kids, making money, you know, finances and all of that. And, um, you know, just to, to, to deal with that, a couple of uh, contributions was many people that actually fall into that trap, even though God has told them, okay, both of you are going to be in the, for example, both of you are going to be in the ministry or, I'm going to raise both of you as kingdom financiers, whatever that might be, even though it's not, it is not narrowed down. Most people that end up not fulfilling their purpose or, or not, or not getting into the full fullness of that purpose is because most of them ended up focusing on the marriage itself instead of focusing on the purpose behind the marriage. So they enter into the marriage and, and they just because of, Oh, the next thing people say, oh, when are we expecting a baby? Oh, um, after the baby, oh, when are you going to buy your own home? Oh, after buying your own home, oh yeah, we have to start saving for retirement and we have to invest and we have to. So they take their focus away from the purpose behind the marriage and they and they and they focus on the marriage itself. So doing that um might make you not feel your so again, it's the the we have we got two answers. Some people think it's you have to you know, get everything narrowed down before marriage. But then some people also thought um, that, and from we also saw it from the word of God that 
you might know your purpose. You might not know the full manifestation of your purpose before marriage, but as long as God has given you a good foundation, you can proceed. But then don't focus on the marriage, focus on the purpose behind the marriage and God will help you to, to get into the fullness of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So Sister Dio, can you please share with us uh, what you talked about in your room? Thank you. Uh, likewise, um, we, we definitely had a varying opinions. Um, one of the, the um, comments for why you should know your purpose before marriage is that you have the potential of putting pressure on your spouse. Um, if, you're, if you are so intent on finding your purpose in marriage, um, you can put pressure on that person to find that purpose for you instead of relying on God. And so that's a concern if you're going into marriage without knowing your purpose. Um, we also talked about the potential if we are if we want our purpose to be found will the person who we're waiting for the the person our spouse will they have to wait forever if we want to find our purpose before marriage so we had those different opinion uh, those views what we also talked about was focusing on our value system knowing what the things that we want even though as we was mentioned we may not know the entirety of everything as long as we know the things that are important to us let's say one thing that's important for you is service if you know that somebody who is not going to um, get angry at you every single time that you're going out or volunteering to do these things. You know that that's, that's something that's an important and value system to you. Um, you also have to make sure that uh, sometimes your spouse may be the person who nudges you towards your purpose. So the person might be somebody who's actually encouraging you or leading you towards your purpose. So that's two different perspectives there. And then at the end, we were able to talk about um, what was mentioned and the question was age pressure. Um, in our culture, in our society, there's always a pressure to do things at a certain time. It's like the world has created a timeline for us and we are so intent on following it. And if we're not intent on following it, people are pushing us towards it, which is why I think we're having a hard time as Christians following the timeline of God is because even God, though God says, oh, your timeline is in like five years, everyone is telling you you should have done it two years ago. So you're on this pressure to get married, on this pressure. And as someone mentioned in our group, if you have pressure to get married now, well, as soon as you get married, you have pressure to have your first child. As soon as you have your first child, you have pressure to get your second child. The pressures will never stop coming, but you have to come to a place of maturity where you know you can stand in the place and timing of God and to walk not just because anybody else is telling you to, but because God has called you to walk. Amen. Amen, thank you very much. <clears throat> Brother Anderson, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, we had some very uh, interesting thoughts from our own session. And um, the first thing is that um, God doesn't really have any interest in hoarding information. Uh, so talking about purpose, you know, it's the scripture said it that it is, it is the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the second part of it said it's also the glory and honor of kings to search it out. So it's not, you know, sometimes when we conceptualize um, purpose, we think that it has to be one big thing that God has to take his time to you know, reveal to us. Sometimes it might just be right in front of us. Sometimes it might just be right in the assignments that has been given to us. So let us not look at it as one. It's something that we can ask and we can receive at the same time. Also, another thing that came, from, came out from what almost everybody said was relationship with God. If your relationship is right, then it is very, very, very possible that um, you will get your purpose right as well. And um, we also said that it was very important to, to find out that it's, it's important to find out your purpose before getting into marriage. Even if you don't have it in, even if, even if it doesn't come in the full package, even if you don't you know, have the, the, the full picture, just have an idea of where you know God is calling you and you can work with that. It's very important because you know um, we quoted Pastor Mouse Monroe. If if the purpose is different, if we are if two people are having different purposes, then that's room for division already, two visions. So it's very important that we find out the purpose um, before getting married, just to know if we are compatible and if we are aligned with the other party. And then to the point of um, uh, time is going, the clock is ticking, uh, just like Mr. Dio rightly said, we also thought about it. Who is the person giving us these timelines? Is it God himself doing it or is it, you know, 
external factors, parents, families, and you know, people around us, or even ourselves. So God is not you know, an author of confusion, like we, we said, so he would not rush us. Um, we, should be, we should be careful to you know, turn down the noise and then emphasize our relationship with God more and find out things that we need to find out before getting in. So if our relationship is right, uh, another person said growth, we have to grow. And that is still coming from the place of relationship. Um, we have to be patient, which is one of the fruit of the spirit. And that would, we can also grow that from the place of relationship. We should be patient and we should not you know, act according to someone else's time, but according to how and when God will have us to stop. That's pretty much what we, we talked about in our group. Thank you very much, Brother Anderson. Okay, I will go to Sister Tokumba. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks. So in our group, uh, we were kind of uh, not divided, but we, we kind of set up, uh, settled on the opinion that it just really depends. It depends on your unique situation. It depends on your relationship with God. Um, in some cases, we talked about how um, Mary and Joseph they both had to have some kind of idea of what the destiny or what the intent of this marriage was supposed to be about. But for Esther and the king, it wasn't necessarily so. Esther found out what her, why she was there, you know, after she got into the marriage. So it depends on what we kind of talked about. But we said that the most important thing, which is what Daryl talked about as well, was that your values are very important and trusting God as well, because you don't know what God's timeline for you is, right? So. Um, just like Bra Anderson and Dial both said, you don't know what God's timeline is. And if God wants marriage to come first, you have to trust him. If God wants that you should know some part or be more clear about your destiny first, you trust him. But that was kind of where we, we landed on that. And we also said that we can never actually know all of our destiny at the very beginning. Like God reveals things and parts to us. You know, one um, season of your life can be about one thing and then he moves you on to something else. So trying to base your decision off of who you're going to marry based on, you know, what you know today might not be the best thing to do because <laughs> you don't know the whole story. Thank you very much, Mr. Takumba. Okay, Brother Osaha, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so what we talked about, we, it's in relation to what Brother Anderson said about a relationship with God. So it depends on, on her relation or on his or her relationship with God. So more or less it's talking about a place of obedience. Now from what was stated, it's she or he is led to marry a, a someone. So that satisfies the question of who, or doesn't satisfy the question of when or what the purpose is. And from what Pastor PK said, he said that purpose spans a lifetime. And because of that, it's in phases. So you can't get everything overnight or at one point in time, it's in phases. It builds the relationship, it builds dependence on God. So um, the brother or sister has to, first of all, focus on their relationship with God because ever before God told them that this person is the person, they were already doing something with God, they were already doing something for God. God had already um, tasked them with something. So it's more or less they should focus on that, keep obeying God. And if indeed they are walking in obedience, then they also know that they can they can also ask God questions. Like we've learned from what Pastor Mildred said, she kept asking God questions. Okay, sometimes we even reason with God, but, God, but God's words to stand short. So um, ask questions. Okay, God, this is the person. This this is the who. But what what about the when? Is it now? Should I start now? Because she also mentioned that starting before the time can lead to some hiccups and some troubles along the way so it all stems back to the relationship with God and if indeed that person is growing in God and, and obeying God then as time passes their purpose will begin to become more clearer either God will tell you okay now is the time go and marry that person now fine go and marry the person now but that doesn't mean you should forget God and just forget everything and focus on the on the trials of life and everything but it means you should also keep asking God even in the marriage what are we doing what what is the next plan what's the next phase and then someone also said that we should also pray the prayer of silencing the outside voices because there are also external factors that will try to pressure you into entering a thing before it's time or starting a thing a thing before it's time so it's also the prayer of okay praying against outside voices and focusing on clear-cut obedience to god and if you are focusing on 
And if you are in obedience to God, everything will become clear to you as time progresses. You just have to keep trusting. So, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, so I'm going to call on Sister Folasha Day um, from Room 7, I believe. Okay, hi, everyone. Um, we made some really good points, um, but I think they all boil down to the fact that it's very important for you to figure out what God, where God, what God is leading you into before you go into marriage. Um, someone mentioned that, you know, like we were told yesterday, purpose comes in faces and why you may not know exactly what to do at every stage of that phase. It's very important for you to um, at least have an idea of where God is leading you before you go ahead into marriage. Now, if you have zero idea and you don't know what God is asking you to do or what he wants you to do, then it's, it's better for you to focus on yourself first, have that relationship with God and allow God to tell you what to do next. Um, also, um, we cannot exclude the fact that, of course, there are pressures on every side for someone who is who is um, at a particular age and people are expecting, family is expecting you to be married already, or even you see your friends um, getting married and um, on the side also seeing them fulfill, I guess you can you know say that you, you're seeing this person married with children, fulfilling purpose one way or the other. And of course, there's that pressure there. And uh, someone said that, at that point, it's very important for you to ask yourself, okay, is God really speaking to me to go into this marriage or am I allowing my emotions and the pressures that I'm facing to make that decision for me? So it's very important because while, while if God is speaking to you, if God is speaking to you, then maybe your purpose, you know, is in that marriage, or maybe you figure it out, or maybe God is trying to show you something um, while you're married. So it's very, very important for you to know, okay, is God speaking to me to take this step and go ahead with this marriage, or am I allowing pressures and my emotions to make that decision for me? And then another point that uh, someone said is that, um, Core, the core purpose is typically unchanging, right? Everything else that you do, including marriage, is an expression of that purpose. So if you're not clear on what your purpose is, don't go into it, right? You need to figure out who you are first, know what God is asking you to do before you take that step, um, regardless of whether you're getting older or not. So I think the most important thing that, I think everything that we talked about, it boils down to the fact that if you, if you haven't figured, figured it out at all, if you have not heard from God, if you don't know, then don't go into that marriage. Because if you go into it, you might become more frustrated. There might still be that void that you're still trying to fill up. But if you at least have an idea of where God is taking you and you have this relationship with God that you know that, okay, it is God that is leading me into this marriage, then you must have a plan for you as well in that marriage. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your contributions. And for our the final room, our group one, pretty much everyone has said everything. The only thing I guess I could add is or what we talked about. We, someone had asked the question is of um, what if someone comes to you and they don't know what their purpose is? What do you do? And we had Pastor Fatako in our room and um, he had said when, you know, when he was talking to his wife, he didn't, he didn't actually know the full, he didn't have the full picture. So um, to him, sometimes, you know, in parts, but he, he, he had an idea, um, but he still didn't know everything. So I think for us, it was just, sometimes you, you learn in part, sometimes you, you, you know, you, you get something small, or sometimes some people know from the very beginning, but um, don't be afraid, don't be scared, don't be anxious. Um, God, the Holy Spirit will guide you and will lead you on the right path. So thank you so much for all of your contributions. Thank you, Zonara. I, uh, I think there's somebody yes, left. Father Father has not spoken. Yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry. I apologize. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thank you, Sister Tom. Um, so for, for our group, uh, just to quickly recap because of time, um, I think the common theme from all the contributions was the, the importance of our relationship with God. That's the foundation of everything. Uh, and it just kept coming through in all the different contributions, right? But uh, because of the, the question itself, where, I mean, if, if age is, is kind of creeping in and, and someone is, you feel that God is leading you to get married, should you go ahead, right? So, I mean, it goes on back to one of the points that Pastor PK mentioned yesterday about the fact that purpose is not just one thing. 
it is iterative, it's in phases, it exposes itself over time, it's for a lifetime. So if, if you have that relationship with God, which is foundation of everything, and you're sure it's God that is leading you, then, then you can go ahead, right? But it's important that you do have some idea. And the other points I came to suggest that is we're born into purpose, actually. So mm. you're already doing your purpose. It's just that you might not know you're doing it. You might not be doing the full expression of it, but you're already doing certain parts of it already, right? And one of the points another person made is the fact that we need to fully understand God's love for us. If you really, really understand how much God loves us, the supreme God, the God that created the universe loves you, and it's not going to want to lead you astray, right? So if you have that as part of our foundation, then we can really, it will make it easy for us to trust God. And just as a last point, um, the part about the pressures of, of age and people starting to put you under pressure that you need to have done certain things at a particular time, uh, one of the few, one of the key contributions there is who defines age, who defines what needs to be done at a particular age, right? God's ways is not our ways. For example, Abraham discovered his purpose at 75, right? And the other angle to that is we need to trust God so much that we don't care what other people say, right? That's, that's literally how the person said it. I, I want to trust God so bad that I don't care what other people say. Right. And then just to conclude around that point is the reason why the age thing becomes a big pressure is because we start comparing ourselves to other people. Oh, my, I'm 25. My friend is 25. My friend that's 25 is married, but I'm not married. Right. So if we can avoid comparison, then that will solve a lot of issue. And one of the ways to do that is to surround ourselves with people that are like minded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Baba Tawa, and I apologize again. Everyone, thank you That's so much. Okay. I have a few a few important announcements. I know that uh, the media team has put it in the chat. So our next session, the time has changed. So I'm just going to read off the time zones. So it starts at 12.45 um, British Columbia time, 1.45 p.m. Alberta time, uh, 1.45 p.m. Saskatchewan time, 2.45 p.m. Manitoba, 3.45 Ontario, 4.45 PEI. So depending on your zone, please um, make sure that you look at the time um, because the time has changed. And then we are adding a third session. Um, we, after the session last night, um, we passed the PK. Um, we're grateful that he agreed to, um, to attend or to come and teach us again um, tonight. So that session will start at, uh, so I'm just going to say Ontario time, Ontario time, 7, 7 p.m. Ontario time. So please, uh, the time zones are in the chat. So please take a look at the chat um, to find out, to look at the time that applies to your zone. All right, so before we close, I'm just going to call on. So I want to apolog apologize to Pastor Patoko. Um, I didn't introduce him earlier. Pastor Patoko is our, I'm just going to say the official title. He's the national advisor to Yazim Canada. Um, I think a lot of you know him, but if you don't, that's Pastor Patoko. And um, I'm going to call on Pastor Debo, who is the assistant national advisor to um, pray and wrap us up um, in, for, the, for this session. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor Fato. I'm always my one man fan. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for being a part of this summit, day two. Uh, you will all agree with me. It's been a great success thus far. And um, it's important also we remind ourselves that uh, we need to find out from the one who is the owner of our purpose, who he created for us in marriage and who he created us for in marriage. So mm -hmm. I call that God factor. God factor is very key in everything we do as children of the most high. Now, it's also very vital to remember that not everyone who comes into your life are meant to be your married partner. I, I always tell this to the young people I come in contact with the best uh, lady singer in the choir might not make the best wife to you as a brother. So you need to understand this and you need to call them as they are or who they are. Like Adam did, Pastor Midred mm -hmm. actually emphasized that. Some of them are just giraffe, lion, 
they are not meant to be the bone of your bone. Some of them are just friends. So it's important you call them who they are and don't just assume, wow, she speaks in tongues, she's spirit filled, she's this, she's that, then she will be the wife. So it's very important. Another key thing I want to emphasize as we wrap up is your spouse is inside of you, not outside mm -hmm. of you, which means um, you will always attract your type. And that is why I'm sorry for as many that came to church looking for spouse and not looking for God. You will always be attracted to a guy or a lady who also came to church for that purpose. But if mm -hmm. you came to church or if you have come to church looking for God, the God of heaven and earth who owns destiny, who owns purpose, is able to guide everyone into what he had in his mind. Because I strongly believe we all existed in God's mind even before the creation of heaven and earth. And that is why none of us is an accident. No, you're, you're not here by accident. Rather, you are an incident going somewhere to happen. And it is our prayer that you, you will happen to make so much impact upon your generation that generations that are yet to be born will hear about you and they will bless God for your life. It's also important we know that purpose is not uh, something that is one thing that is given to you at a point, I mean, at a time. It is see as you go, as Pastor Piki already emphasized yesterday, as you progress. Um, for example, in my life, I, I mean, those of you that are very familiar, if you notice on my email signature, at a point I had, maybe before I met this group, right? That was a long time ago. I had on my signature, in pursuit of purpose, which means I was running after my purpose to discover what it is. But if you see my signature today, it says in fulfillment of purpose, which means I have discovered it. I'm working day and night to fulfill it. So it's very important that you understand this purpose thing is not something you figure out in one day. So it's as you go. And also you cannot stay stagnant and say until I discover this purpose, I'm not going to take a step, right? You cannot say until I discover the very career I want to pursue in life, I'm not going to start school. You'll be amazed that by the time you discover what career interests you, you'll probably get into old to start learning certain things. So as you learn along the line, things become clearer and you work in it. So it's very important that you know that the person you align yourself with or you want to choose as your spouse or your partner will affect how you arrive at your destiny or your destination. So it's very key you, you, you understand this. And also God's best is never in the now. The Bible tells us that God reserved the best to the end. So whatever you think you have now is not probably the best you can get. It, you might think it's the best, but in God's sight, it might just be a good thing for you to have because he always reserved the best to the end. And above all, as I wrap up, Remember, and I know a lot of young people ask this question. So if God knows the reason and the purpose for which he created me, that means he knows the man or the woman I'm supposed to be married to. Pastor Miller was emphatic on that. There is godly options. So don't always think it's just one person, right? There is godly options. Everyone God brings your way does not mean it is he or she. He or she might just be a lion or giraffe that you need to give that name to until the bone of your bone and the flesh of your flesh comes your way. Lastly, I want you to know, slow progress is far better than no progress at all. So take a step, trust God, live in fulfillment of his counsel. The Bible says, as many as are led by the Lord, they are the sons of God. Allow God to lead you at all times. Yes, thank you, Gabriel. Purpose is a journey. You need to take the step, step out. When God said to Abraham, go out, he says, I will show you. 
God never told Abraham, this is it, go figure it out. So we need to step out. And as you go, he will lead you all the way. As long as you remain faithful and commitment to God's purpose, you will never miss it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So um, on that note, I want to once again say thank you to everyone. I want to appreciate God for the leadership, Pastor Fato Kuhn. Uh, we, we bless God for your life, sir. We celebrate you and will forever be grateful to God for blessing us with a man of purpose. Uh, purposeful leadership you have brought into Yasin, Canada can never be fathomed. I can, I can bet you. And to every zona rep, to the facilitators of this summit, uh, Bro Sinachi, Tong, and all of you, I can tell you, you will never lose your reward in Jesus' name. As leaders are being birthed, as leaders are being raised, as leaders' lives are being impacted for God's kingdom, I can assure you, you will have a part in their testimony. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank God for Pastor Midred uh, Kingsley Okonko in absentia. She was a great blessing to us this morning. And um, I think God is helping us in Yasin, Canada now to form alliance with great people, which we are going to leverage the giftings of God in them to continually transform men's life for his glory. It is my prayer that every one of you on this platform who is a leader, because this is just a leadership summit, you are a leader. Uh, someone said to me in the course of the week, everybody, every man is a priest on his own. And you have to be a priest to yourself first before you can be a priest to another person. All of you are leaders. You need to lead yourself first. And as you lead yourself, God of heaven will back you up to be a genuine leader that will inspire sons and daughters unto Zion in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Shall we bow down our head as we pray? I want you to appreciate God for the privilege given you to be a partaker of these blessings of this summit. I want you to say, Father, in as much as it depends on me, I will commit to your purpose for my life. Help me to arrive at that safe ever. Help you, God, not to throw away your purpose upon my life. Help me not to make a shipwreck of this calling. My Father and my God, divinely back me up to be able to accomplish purpose, whether in marriage, in ministry, in every area of my life. The Lord, I will answer all the days of my life for the things of God, and your glory will radiate in all my ways. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mighty God, we commit all unto you, the most gracious Father. Because we are persuaded you are able to keep that which is committed unto you. Lord, keep us, uphold us with your righteous right hand. Let our lives continue to bring glory and honor to your name. We proclaim, Father, by the virtue of our calling in you. Lord, every resource we require to fulfill purpose, every resource we require to be found worthy of this calling, Father, we will not be found wanting in them, and you'll make them available to us in abundance in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As we go now for break, Father, keep us, and as we reconvene later, let your presence abide with us. Thank you, precious Father. In Jesus' mighty and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, again. Uh, so reminder, Purpose and Leadership is next. And then see you later in the evening for Purpose and Ministry. So enjoy your break and you know, think about your, your purpose and where God is taking you as we break for the next couple of hours. See you, very, see you in a few hours. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you.